Muchas gracias, uh, Pablo. Buenas tardes. And at that point, we may change to English. <laughs> uh, as Roger and I are, uh, are as, as Pablo said, a, a somewhat unusual pairing of an artist and a scientist, we thought that before getting into the subject, we, it might be helpful for each of us to tell you a little bit about our own work and how that led to exploring what we've called penultimate curiosity. So, this is a, uh, a painting of mine which is called Menorah, um, which was bought by the Ashmolean Museum in Oxford uh, a couple of years ago. Uh, the building in the background is a, is a power station just outside Oxford that was pulled, um, pulled down, uh, but I, I used to pass it in the train every day when I was a student. And I was always struck both by the, the, the beauty and, and power of the technology, but also by a feeling that this was a, an alien presence in, in the landscape. And as I began to paint and draw it, there were two associations that came to mind. Uh, the first was that the smoke pouring out of the chimneys reminded me of, of, of the Holocaust, um, of Auschwitz, of things like that. But on the other hand, the, the seven chimneys uh, formed the pattern of a menorah, um, the, the seven-branched candlestick in the Jewish temple, so that it seemed to speak um, both of the absence of God and of the presence of God. So when I painted in the... It, it seemed natural to put uh, in the foreground uh, a crucifixion, which expresses exactly that, that same conjunction. It's not actually the only picture that I've painted that has this kind of ambiguity. This is a, a uh, no, it's not. Somehow got mixed. This is a, is another painting, um, which is called uh, Abraham and the Angels, and the the starting point uh, of this was a, a nuclear power station in the uh, in the fields near my parents' home, um, which again has this. Uh, rather beautiful sense, but also it's, a, it's an alien presence in the landscape and has the sense, um, I was struck very much by the, the, the latent destructive power of a, of, of a nuclear uh, reactor. And it reminded me of the story um, uh, in which Abraham has a picnic with the angels just before the destruction of, uh, of, of Sodom and Gomorrah. Many artists actually have felt this um, these kind of ambiguous feelings about science and technology. Um, on the one hand, there's an excitement uh, about the, the, the power of, of a new technology and about the new understandings of the world uh, that it can bring. But on the other hand, there's also a, a worry about what science could destroy. And at the beginning of the 19th century, um, these worries focused not so much on the, uh, on the physical destruction, but on the destruction of a whole way of, of looking at the world. Almost exactly 200 years ago, there was a, a dinner party that took place in a studio of an English painter called um, Benjamin Hayden. Um, and if I actually go back now to that, that image before, um, he, this was a picture that he was painting. And it, he, he invited all his friends along. Among them were many of the famous uh, romantic poets at the time. Um, John Keats and uh, William Wordsworth were both there. And one of these um, uh, writers who was standing in front of the, the picture noticed that, that just there, as a, he'd inserted a portrait of, of Isaac Newton. Um, and uh, he was, this man was really cross, and he was uh, uh, attacking the painter for including a, a portrait of a fellow, he said, who believed nothing unless it was as clear as three sides of a triangle. Uh, and he said that both, both he and, and Keats agreed that Newton had destroyed all the poetry of the rainbow by reducing it to prismatic colors. And the whole party drank uh, Newton's health and confusion to mathematics. Two years later, uh, Keats wrote a poem about this, which, which um, starts, there was an awful rainbow once in heaven. We know her woof and texture. She is given in the dull catalogue of common things. Philosophy will clip an angel's wings. 
conquer all mysteries by rule and line, empty the haunted air and nomad wine, unweave a rainbow. Now, actually, Keats was a medical student, so it's not clear how, how seriously he meant all that. But that idea was very much in the air. 25 years before that dinner party, another one had taken place um, among radical thinkers, which uh, included um, Mary Wollstonecroft and Thomas Paine, um, but also some artists, uh, including the, the artist William Blake. Um, uh, and Blake was very much a religious artist, but uh, among orthodox religious people, he was often thought of as a heretic. Um, but among the, the rationalist thinkers, he was, uh, he was, as his biographer put it, a saint and staunchly defended Christianity. For Thomas Paine, um, who was uh, present at the dinner party, and if I just go back there, to, he, he, Paine thought of Newton as very much a, uh, a symbol of the scientific rationalism that should replace revealed religion. And he might well have agreed with Saint Simon, who a couple of years later argued that churches should be replaced by temples of Newton. And this was a, a picture of a, a proposed temple of Newton. Uh, and it was immediately after uh, Paine had to leave very rapidly for France that Blake drew this uh, famous image of Newton, um, which shows him holding a pair of dividers. And it's meant to illustrate uh, the text that he who sees the ratio sees only himself. And a few years later, he wrote to a friend, may God save us from single vision and Newton's sleep. That, that kind of, uh, of negative portrayal of science was, however, essentially a reaction to attempts to, to weaponize science in a battle for intellectual credibility and ha had not necessarily been a, a, a typical artistic response. We only need to, to think of Leonardo's anatomical drawings or, um, or indeed of Velasquez's uh, portrayal of the stroboscopic effect to see how closely artistic and scientific exploration have been linked together. Uh, a few years after that dinner party in, in Hayden's studio, two great English landscape painters, um, Turner and Constable, um, both had a, a dine together at the Royal Academy in London. We don't know what they, they talked about, but actually it might have been science. And we know that because Turner was friendly with a number of, of scientists, in, including um, Michael Faraday, whom he shared an interest in, in, in storms uh, with. Uh, and Constable, we know, was very much interested in the classification of clouds, uh, but also uh, with rainbows. He was uh, very interested in, in how rainbows were formed. Uh, and in fact, in a, a series of uh, diagrams, um, which he may have got his, his children's maths tutor to help him with, <laughs> um, he works his way through the geometry of primary and secondary bow formation as explained by Newton and his successors. But far from destroying the poetry of the rainbow, these studies enabled him to render it more powerfully. Uh, and for what, what he called them the mild art of promise um, was still full of meaning. Um, it's, it's recently been argued that um, a picture of, of Constables, which um, was the view of, of Salisbury Cathedral from the, the, the water meadows, um, he added a rainbow to it um, on the, the death of his great friend, um, Archdeacon John Fisher, who was, um, who was a clergyman, but uh, was, was Constables probably his greatest friend. Um, and it's thought that he actually added that rainbow, which falls on the, exactly on the house where John Fisher lived. Uh, he actually added it on the day of, of Fisher's death. The year that I started um, painting the menorah, which I showed you at the beginning, I also started illustrating the book of Job. 
this is uh, uh, the moment at the end of the book of Job uh, when everyone has finally stopped speaking and the Lord finally answers Job um, from out of the whirlwind. His answer, though, uh, is a series of questions, about 140 in all. Um, he begins by asking Job, who is this who speaks words without knowledge? Answer me if you can. And then asks, where were you when I laid the foundation of the world? When the morning stars sang together and all the sons of God shouted for joy. Can you tell me, can you tell the lightnings where to go? So that they say to you, here we are. Can you pull in Leviathan with a fish hook or put him on a leash for your girls? He makes the ocean boil like a pot and stirs up the sea like ointment. One would think the deep had white hair. All of which prompts Job to reply, I spoke of things I did not understand. My ears had heard of you, but now my eyes have seen you. Therefore, I despise myself and repent in dust and ashes. There are extraordinarily profound chapters. And one of the things that they suggest is that wonder is a path to understanding, uh, and that that is something that is true for both science and art. Scientists and artists pursue their work in, in very different ways, uh, but they can talk to one another. Constable uh, and his friend Archdeacon John Fisher lived very, in very different worlds, um, but their correspondence uh, was enriching uh, to both of them. Uh, and in a similar way, when Andrew and I uh, began a conversation about art uh, and science and religion, it led us in a direction that neither of us expected. Well, uh, let me tell you a little bit about the work that uh, I do in my laboratory. Uh, I have the chair in nanomaterials at Oxford. That means small stuff. And the kind of question that we ask in our laboratory is um, questions like, um, how does electricity flow through one single molecule? Now, um, let, let me just um, get a little bit of uh, a survey here. Uh, how many people here uh, believe that molecules are real? Put your hand up if you think the molecules are real. Okay, almost all. One or two doubters, but there we go. <laughs> how many people here have seen a molecule? So now, could someone here, so I'll just tell you the front, nobody's put up a hand. Could someone tell me what leads you to believe that molecules are real? If you haven't seen one, silence. <laughs> In the 19th century, it was a matter of considerable controversy as to whether or not molecules were real. Um, the 1869 presidential address, uh, you know, said on the one hand some people do believe in them, on the other hand some don't. Uh, Van der Waals, uh, after whom uh, we have Van der Waals forces, uh, named, uh, was passionate advocate for the reality of molecules. Uh, his contemporary Ludwig Boltzmann, one of the founders of statistical mechanics, uh, was convinced that they were incompatible with the very well-established second law of thermodynamics. And <clears throat> the uh, controversy raged on uh, to be resolved uh, to a large extent by this man. Who's that? Albert Einstein. Uh, he's usually, you know, he's usually seen in rather older, grayer versions of him. But there he is. In uh, 1905, he had an extraordinary year. He uh, discovered the photoelectric effect. He discovered Brownian motion. He discovered what he's now probably best known for: special relativity. And he also um, uh, looked at the equivalence of mass and energy. 
And uh, in fact, if you include his PhD thesis, which was completed by then, but only published a year later, he published five different methods of arriving at the Avogadro number. That's the number of molecules that there are in a box about that big at uh, room temperature and pressure. And uh, he came up with a number of about 6 times 10 to the 23 by all these methods that were quite independent of one another. And uh, four years later, he wrote, I think that it will henceforth be difficult to defend by rational arguments a hostile attitude to molecular hypothesis. What he meant by that was, look, if all these different methods of calculating the number of molecules of air at standard pressure and temperature in a box, that if they all end up with about the same figure, that's a pretty good argument that molecules are real. But it was to be 50 years before uh, people could actually see molecules. Now, in um, the Department of Material at Oxford, there are at least three different ways of imaging molecules. Uh, one of them is using um, a field iron microscope, now in its version called an atom probe, where you can not only see the individual atoms, but you can take them and weigh them one at a time, and thereby decide what kind of attitude amount uh, molecule that is, or atom. <clears throat> These are some pictures that uh, I took a few years ago by scanning tunneling microscopy, another technique, and you're seeing arrays of molecules there. And now the technique that we use most of all is transmission electron microscopy, and those are some pictures of molecules, of uh, fullerene molecules, um, 82 atoms of carbon each with uh, the little dark spot inside each of those is a, uh, a lanthanum atom. And in fact, they're arranged inside a single walled carbon nanotube. And to get some sense of the scale, um, the diameter of those molecules is about a billionth of a meter, okay, one nanometer. So what we do now in the laboratory is uh, we take um, a piece of graphene we uh, cut it into a shape that looks a bit like a bow tie, and then by uh, a rather sophisticated electroburning technique, we create a gap that's about one molecule wide. And then we take the molecule of interest, and we connect to it two uh, molecular wires, and then something like a molecular sticky note, so that it sticks down uh, with wired to those two pieces of graphene. And then we can study how the electricity flows through it. And we deliberately engineer the molecules to show significant quantum effects, quantum resonances, quantum interference, and so on. And we can actually see what we're doing by electron microscopy. This is a fairly typical picture of uh, graphene. It's taken with a resolution of about 80 picometers and a precision of about five picometers. A uh, picometer is a thousandth of a billionth of a meter. Are there two seats for two people who've just arrived? You're welcome. You're very welcome. Can we find seats for them? Have you found a seat there? That's good. Um, and the spacing between um, carbon atoms in this material, graphene, is about uh, 142 picometers. And we can watch how the electricity flows through, and we can even see how the electricity interacts with vibrational modes of the um, molecule. So there's a little uh, uh, molecular dynamics calculation using density functional theory to calculate how that molecule might vibrate. And uh, on the right-hand side, it's what we call a charge stability diagram. So the vertical axis is the voltage between the two graphene electrodes, the source drain voltage. And the horizontal axis is the voltage applied to a nearby gate. So that changes the e energy of the molecule. And the, the stripes that you can see in that picture are actually evidence of the way that one electron going into and out of that molecule interacts with the kind of vibrational modes that you're seeing uh, simulated in that model there. So those are the kind of um, uh, experiments that we might do in the laboratory. Uh, we, we can uh, interact with other vibrating objects. In the case of this molecule, we have to infer the vibration from um, the, uh, the spectrum that we're seeing there. 
but sometimes we can measure the vibration directly. This is um, a, a picture of what is, I suppose, the world's smallest guitar string. It's a single-walled nanotube uh, bridging between two electrodes, and uh, we can actually measure the displacement of that guitar string. So we use a, a, an electrical circuit like this to, to, to uh, uh, measure it. Uh, we have to do these, we, we don't want the thing to be banged around by thermal excitation, so we go to a cold enough temperature to um, uh, eliminate the thermal excitations. So in the picture on the left there, you'll see our Spanish-speaking uh, brilliant scientist, uh, Natalia Ares. She's actually from Argentina, but I'm told her Spanish is intelligible in Spain. <laughs> and uh, uh, we're looking there at um, a dilution fridge that we use for these experiments, where we achieve temperatures colder than anywhere in the universe outside a human laboratory, as far as we know. So uh, we go to about um, a 50th of a degree absolute. Um, for uh, the uh, experiments. And uh, again, we can measure how the electricity uh, flows through the uh, wire, but we can also measure the vibrations of the wire as it vibrates. And the, the um, diagram you're seeing there is a measure of the frequency of the wire as we tune, as it were, the guitar string at the end. And the amazing thing is that each of those dips that you're seeing corresponds to one electron being added to the wire. And we can see the change in frequency because of the stiffness of the wave function of that one electron. I mean, it's quite extraordinary to be able to measure on the nanoscale like this. And one of the experiments that we're able to do with this is experiments into the nature of reality. It's quite extraordinary that we can measure in the laboratory uh, uh, quantities that enable us to test philosophical interpretations of quantum theory. Two, years, two, two, two weeks ago, I was speaking at the 80th birthday party in Illinois of Sir Anthony Leggett. And he was an Oxford undergraduate who studied classics. He studied the Greek and Roman philosophers. And he got a first-class degree in classics. And then he decided that he'd like to learn quantum theory. And he got good enough at that to win a Nobel Prize in 2005 for the quantum theory of cold matter. But he never lost the rigor that he had acquired through studying the classical philosophers as an undergraduate. And in quantum theory, a whole lot of questions are raised about the nature of reality. Is the quantum state a state of reality or merely a description of our knowledge? And uh, Tony Leggett uh, in 1985 uh, devised uh, a, a rigorous mathematical test to evaluate certain interpretations of reality within quantum theory. For a quarter of a century, no one could see how to do the experiments because it was so hard to fulfill the very exacting requirements. And, and then I had an idea, and we were actually able to do an experiment that ruled out a particular interpretation. And that's what I was talking about as my birthday present to Tony Leggett on his 80th birthday two weeks ago. But this whole question about reality, what is real? Why, why do we care about reality? Why, why does it matter to us what reality is? And as... Roger and I started to talk about that. Well, I'll let him introduce a bit of a film. It'll show you how. I'm standing at the junction of two roads in the center of Oxford. Down there are the spires and towers of the historic buildings at the heart of the university. To my right and behind me, the streets are lined with new laboratories. Laboratories are being built in universities all over the world. But it's easy to forget what a recent phenomenon this is. In 1860, 
a cousin of my grandfather, who was an undergraduate at the time, took a photograph from just about this spot. Here it is. It shows a, a new building that had just been put up. There's still scaffolding around the door. Now, in the 18th century, there had been an observatory that had built just down the road. But since then, this was pretty much the first purpose-built scientific construction that the university had ever commissioned. And if we walk a few yards down the road, we'll see that it's still there. When I was an undergraduate myself, about to leave the academic world and go off to art school, I became fascinated by this building. I was intrigued by the way it brought so many things together. As an artist, I've sometimes put new work in very old buildings. But I've also been interested in the collision between ancient stories and contemporary realities. This building, the Oxford University Museum, was full of such collisions. It was built in the style of a Rhenish medieval town hall, but constructed like a Victorian railway station in the latest materials of steel and glass. It was a building dedicated to the accuracies of science, but gave artists and craftsmen a free hand to indulge their fantasy and imagination. This museum had interested me for all kinds of artistic reasons. But when I came back to Oxford after art school and, and started work, I began to get interested in the scientific history of this place. And what had prompted that interest was getting to know a scientist. Today, Andrew Briggs is the first professor of nanomaterials at Oxford University. He investigates the strange world of quantum effects that lie at the roots of matter. When I first met him, he'd recently returned to science after taking a theology degree. For many years, my studio was on the top floor of the house in North Oxford, where the Briggs family lived. And during those years, we began a conversation about science that later turned into a book. For Andrew, as for me, a starting point had been an interest in a particular building. Uh, in the final year, uh, when I was an undergraduate at Oxford, I went for an interview in one of the most famous research institutes in the world, the Cavendish Laboratory in Cambridge. It was an exciting moment, and as I walked through the entrance, I saw a Latin inscription that was carved on the doors. A hundred years earlier, uh, a Cambridge parish priest had gone to call on a bedridden parishioner who was the man responsible for that inscription. The man was suffering from advanced stomach cancer uh, and would die within days. He'd had a bad night and the priest had come to bring him communion uh, and didn't expect conversation. Uh, but as he robed himself, he was astonished to hear a voice from the bed reciting from memory all five verses of a 17th century poem about the robing of Aaron. What the priest didn't know and didn't discover was that the man on the bed had changed the world. Fifteen years earlier, in what Richard Feynman described as the most significant event of the 19th century, he had written down four equations which not only describe a fundamental characteristic of the universe, but provide the basis for every electronic technology in the world today. What the priest did discover was that his parishioner seemed to know pretty well the entire Bible by heart, uh, and that the inscription from Psalm 111 on, the, on his laboratory doors had been inspired by a deep faith. The laboratory at Cambridge was one of the first purpose-built general scientific institutes in an English university, but not the first. The Oxford University Museum was older. At about the same time that Andrew started work at the Cavendish, um, I was uh, an undergraduate at, uh, at Oxford, about to head off to art school. And as you heard in the film, uh, I became fascinated um, by this building. 
its designers had intended it uh, to be the first building since the medieval cathedrals in which artisans and sculptors were given a free hand. Uh, and the relief over the entrance, um, which you'll see in a moment, which shows an angel um, holding a, a book in one hand and a germ cell in the other, uh, was intended to express the idea of a fundamental unity between art and science and religion. The story of that sculpture and of the inscription in Cambridge inspired for both of us a 16-year intellectual journey. How, we asked each other, were the motivations of the religious invocations on the outside of these buildings related to the motivations of the scientific investigations that went on inside? For more than two centuries now, historians of science have been interested in the, in the complex connections between religion and science. Obviously, what we now call science and religion have changed and developed over history, and it's hard to establish straightforward causal connections uh, between these two kind of changes. Nevertheless, there are clearly correlations, and it seems unlikely to be mere coincidence that dramatic changes both in science and in religion have on several key occasions occurred at more or less the same time. Scientists like me who experimentally investigate the nature of quantum reality are interested in the way that particles like photons and electrons can be correlated, even though they might be at opposite ends of the universe. It's called quantum entanglement. You might, in a similar way, describe the connection between religion and science as a kind of entanglement. But what is the nature of, of that uh, entanglement? Artists like me who, who tackle religious subjects are often interested in finding connections between the sublimity and fascination uh, of the universe that surrounds us, which science enables us to see in a third person perspective, uh, and the internal first-person perspective that seems to constantly urge us to reach out beyond the horizons of the visible world. And in fact, the impulses which first drove human beings to create images of the visible world around us seem to have been religious. The first clear evidence of religious behavior and the emergence of what paleontologists call homo religiosus goes back to some burials about 90,000 years ago, but a new kind of evidence is expressed in the earliest cave paintings, which appeared some 40,000 years ago. The, 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 the recent discoveries in the cave at La Barciega at Cantabria suggest that Neanderthals were painting here in Spain even earlier. One reason that it made sense for an artist and a scientist to think about this together is that we can see a deep connection between behavior that appears to be religiously expired and a curiosity about the natural world. We know that Paleolithic people didn't live in the deep caves uh, where they made these images, which they seem to have used for religious ceremonies of some kind. Um, what is evident, though, from the great painted complexes at Altamira here in Spain and at Lascaux and Chauvet in, in France is that the people who created them invested a vast amount of human resources of time and energy in their creation so that we can assume that they were of central importance to the communities that produced them. And throughout history, human communities have continued to invest enormous resources in religious artifacts and constructions. From Altamira to the ziggurats, from the pyramids to Stonehenge, from the caves to the cathedrals. We may have very different opinions about why human beings have invested so much time and energy in such things, but we can all agree that they have. It seems unlikely that prehistoric communities would devote resources to observing and studying the natural world um, simply for the sake of it. But could observations like these be stimulated and carried along uh, by the motivation which led people to make these uh, images deep underground. You can think of it as being like a slipstream. When geese fly in a V formation, or when Tour de France cyclists form a peloton, 
Those behind don't have to work as hard as those in front. They get a free ride in the slipstream. Whatever the exact motivation um, of the people who made these paintings, we can be fairly sure that they didn't set out to investigate the anatomy of a horse. Yet, with each successive image, uh, the painter who drew these pictures, and we know it was one person, and they did one image on top of them, uh, the one behind it, corrected themselves through a, a possibly unconscious experimental process of trial and error, he or she produced a series that progressively becomes more anatomically correct uh, until finally they end up with an image that Leonardo wouldn't have been ashamed of. As far as we know, that image didn't produce a whole new style of cave painting. The slipstream of religious motivation wasn't perhaps strong enough for that. But when agriculture came on the scene and settled societies developed with forms of writing, a whole new series of organized religions began to appear all over the world, in China, in India, in the Middle East, and in the Americas. And tucked in behind them are developments in astronomy, in medicine, in mathematics, and in chemistry, enjoying, as it were, a free ride in those more powerful slipstreams. Why do geese fly in that particular V formation? Why do Tour de France riders stay within inches um, of the rider in front? The answer is that certain configurations not only reduce the wind resistance, but can actually create an energetic advantage from a vortex. So are there parallels to these kind of special configurations in the development of religions which have created equivalents to this kind of energetic advantage. In the Greek colony of Miletus in the 6th century BC, the idea began to develop that there might be a single divine principle, what they called an arche, behind everything that we see. There was vigorous debate about how to describe it, but now instead of seeing earthquakes as Poseidon shaking the ground or thinking of the sun as Helios riding his chariot, the idea of one divine rational principle behind everything made room for a new kind of curiosity about the material world. You might call it a penultimate curiosity. And as the idea of a single pen print divine principle begins to take hold, so traveling in its slipstream, this new kind of penultimate curiosity about the material world accelerates. And they're off. <laughs> <laughs> Plato. Uh, and his followers begin to apply geometry to the motion of the planets. Aristotle sets up his Lycaeum as a kind of research institute where his disciples study every aspect of the physical world. And using that model, the library and the museum at Alexandria is established as a research facility for scholars throughout the Hellenistic world. Fast forward to the first centuries, and as Jewish and Christian thinkers begin to come into contact with Greek science, they introduced the idea that the divine cannot be identified with any part of the physical universe, but must stand behind it, determining the laws that shape it. With the coming of Islam, Muslim scholars emphasize that Allah who creates everything is the source of all truth, so that truth must be sought and embraced in whatever culture it can be found. In the slipstream of that idea, a massive translation movement is begun in the 10th century. The House of Wisdom is established in Baghdad, and astronomical observatories are built throughout the Muslim world. Outside the Muslim world, starting in Spain, uh, these ideas begin to be picked up in the West in the 12th century and developed in the new Christian universities, where following up the idea of a divine lawgiver, scholars and theologians begin to search for mathematical laws underlying physical phenomena and to use what they call experimental science to study the world. When new technologies come online, when telescopes and microscopes begin to open up the depth of the universe and the world of the small, and printing enables the rapid transfer of information, the speed increases. Galileo uh, is able to demonstrate by looking at mountains on the moon that Aristotle was wrong and an early Christian philosopher was right in arguing that the planets and the Earth seem to be made from the same kind of stuff and is able through practical experiments and mathematical demonstrations to give substance to that same philosopher's intuition that the heavens and the earth might be governed by the same laws. 
when Luther and others set out to democratize the reading of God's word, later Reformation thinkers like Francis Bacon apply this to the reading of God's works, suggesting it needs to be a joint enterprise in which all conditions of people have a part. In the front pieces of his books, he used an image which evoked the Portuguese and Spanish voyages of discovery to suggest that such an intellectual adventure was a God-given calling. And now we're piling on speed. In Oxford and elsewhere in the 17th century, groups of experimenters, astronomers, and mathematicians begin to come together and collaborate. The Royal Society is founded and its transactions published. Isaac Newton, in his Principia Mathematica, describes a law-like universe. The most beautiful system of the sun and the planets, which could only proceed from the counsel and dominion of an intelligent being. And suddenly we're flying. Laws of nature are looked for everywhere. How much more simple and sublime, says Darwin, if God says, let animals be created by fixed laws of generations. Universities begin to put up buildings like the Oxford Museum of Natural History and... W what about the conflicts? Excuse me? <laughs> well, this was the point uh, <laughs> when at the launch of the, uh, of the English edition um, of, of our book, in the, which actually happened in the Oxford University Museum, when a, a distinguished professor leapt up um, in the audience uh, and asked why we were leaving out the conflicts um, between religion and science. Uh, and we decided to address the question um, there and then, which actually worked quite well. <laughs> so I went back to the idea of slipstreaming and described how in the Tour de France the drag on the lead cyclist increases with speed. To gain maximum benefit, the next cyclist must follow as closely as possible, within centimetres of the leader sometimes. But at high speeds, um, a clash of wheels sometimes occurs, which can spell disaster. Hence, you get the, the, the chute um, or, or pile-ups, which are very much a feature uh, of that race. And in a similar way, when science really begins to start straveling in the slipstream of religion, the temptation to close the gap between them, uh, to make science answer religious questions and vice versa, uh, can become very strong. And the clash of ideas that results that can produce a, a, a kind of a shoot, a, an intellectual pile-up in which everyone falls over. So we went back to uh, an earlier slide um, uh, and told the story in a slightly different way. Uh, and it went like this. So they're off again, and Plato seizes on the idea that the planets move in perfect geometrical circles around the Earth to prove the rationality of the universe. Epicurus denies the validity of research that doesn't contribute to peace of mind. Right explanations are dismissed. Wrong explanations are set in stone. And they're down. Fast forward 2,000 years, and the idea seized on by Plato and developed by Ptolemy has now been accepted by most astronomers. So when a canon at Frombork Cathedral called Nicholas Copernicus produces a model with the sun at its centre uh, and a Catholic layman called Galileo Galilei produces an argument... They're not observational proof. ...that, that Copernicus is right, religious authority is used to stifle dissent... Alternative explanations are suppressed... Wrong explanations are set in stone... And they're down. A century later, uh, Newton's Principia uh, is, uh, is taken, as we saw uh, earlier on, by materialists as a proof for materialism uh, and by theists as a proof for natural theology. The weaponization of science in the battle for intellectual credibility produces a stalemate, which is followed by the beginning of a romantic repudiation of science. And it's a shoot, and they're down. And now we're in the 19th century, and attempts to prove God does or doesn't exist move from physics to biology. William Paley's natural theology finds evidence for God in everything from the hinge of a bivalve to an alderman's epiglottis. Darwin's theory of, you, uh, of evolution uh, is, is used by secularists to discredit the book of Genesis. The idea of intelligent design may not be amenable to scientific investigation, but it's perfectly suited to popular philosophical controversy. And there... Down, it's a shoot, it's a massive pile-up. 
Uh, and of course, in the Tour de France, whenever there is a, a shoot, uh, a large scale pile up like this, the, uh, the race is cancelled and everybody goes home. Uh, actually, Roger, I don't think that is what happens. It isn't? Well, according to the instructions, race marshals should try to prevent falls in the first place by, play, by, by blowing whistles and waving flags to warn of tricky conditions. When falls happen, in most cases, competitors will get back on their bikes. The marshal's job is then to move aside bicycles that are obstructing the route. So our next question when was, are there people in history who have acted, as it were, like race marshals, warning of tricky conditions and clearing away obstacles? Let's run the story one final time, focusing now not on slipstreams or shoots, but on a few of the people who've taken on this marshalling role. And warning, sorry, <laughs> warning against um, hazards in the relationship between science and religion, and showing how these two different forms of curiosity most fruitfully work together. I wanted to get on because our first, our first race marshal is a great hero of mine, a man called John Philoponus, who was the Christian philosopher I referred to earlier, um, who in this recently discovered pagan philosophical school in 6th century Alexandria warned his fellow believers that the purpose of the scriptures was to reveal the fact of God's creation, but not how it came about. And he tried to demonstrate to his pagan philosophical colleagues that the idea that the heavens were eternal and made of a divine material was ill-founded. Philoponus argued that we need to study the universe as it is. A thousand years before Galileo, he observed, contrary to what Aristotle has asserted, that two unequal weights dropped from a given height strike the ground at almost the same time. He conjectured that God might have established a single kinetic force that moved both the sun, moon, and stars and gave objects on Earth that trend to move. His slogan was, let nothing in any manner Get in the way of truth. 300 years down the track, as it winds through 9th century Baghdad, is our next marshal, Abu Yasuf Yaqub al-Kindi, a man described as the philosopher of the Arabs. Who promoted the adoption of Indian numerals by the Arabs and wrote that we must not be ashamed to admire the truth or acquire it from wherever it comes, even if it should come from far-flung nations and foreign peoples. All are ennobled by it. Another 400 years, another route comes through Spain, where in Cordoba, the Muslim scholar Avarez and the Jewish scholar Maimimides build bridges from the classical world to their own, and where in Toledo, Arabic-speaking Christians begin to translate classical texts into Latin. From there, the route passes through 13th century Oxford, and here is Robert Grossetest, in effect the first chancellor of Oxford University before he became Bishop of Lincoln. He translated Aristotle and wrote one of the first Latin commentaries on his writings. Grosstest argued that Christians shouldn't pointlessly try to make a Christian out of Aristotle, but should learn from his method of arriving at the truth. He was one of the first people to outline the methodology of what we would describe as a controlled experiment. Uh, and he went on to do pioneering work uh, on the geometry of light that inspired Roger Bacon. And staying in Oxford, but moving on another 400 years, as we come past Wadham College, here is the warden, John Wilkins, later Bishop of Chester. Who, eight years after the condemnation of Galileo, brought out uh, a little book in which uh, Copernicus, uh, Galileo, and Kepler all appear as the hero of his title page. Wilkins started an experimental club of people from different backgrounds who went on to become founders of the explicitly non-sectarian Royal Society. He even campaigned in the House of Lords for the toleration of dissenters. And now staying in Oxford but coming to the final straight uh, is Henry Ackland, doctor and Regis Professor of Medicine who was a friend of the art critic John Ruskin, studied with painter Samuel Palmer uh, and is my personal hero. Ackland Champion Scientific Medicine became a passionate advocate of public health and led the movement for developing science within the university. He won theologians to the cause of science uh, and campaigned to award Darwin 
an honorary degree. He saw religion, science and art as complementary endeavours and brought them together in the museum that he campaigned for. Uh, if you ever come to Oxford, uh, come to the, the Natural History Museum uh, and look around you. There's a little bit of field here which shows the Natural History Museum, but as we've been going on a little long, I think we shall, <laughs> we shall leave it out uh, and you must come and have a look at it. It's a fantastic place. In fact, uh, uh, Ruskin, who was the, the art critic involved, was so committed to this project that he actually built one of the, the pillars in, in, the, in the museum with his own hand. Is that the one that had to be taken down and rebuilt by a professional bricklayer? Yes. <laughs> I make no comment on the artistic temperament. <laughs> very, very commendable. <laughs> Finally, travelling to Cambridge, we arrived back where we started with the patient on the bed whom some of you will have recognised as James Clark Maxwell. The inscription which Maxwell had carved on the doors uh, of the Cavendish Laboratory was a quotation from Psalm 111. As a graduate student, I suggested that Maxwell's quotation should be placed over the new Cavendish entrance, but now in English. A policy of the committee of the laboratory actually enthusiastically agreed to this. It reads, The works of the Lord are great, sought out of all them that have pleasure therein. While Maxwell thought that Christians whose minds were scientific should approach their work in this spirit, he was equally clear that, that because science was always changing, it was a mistake to look for any static harmony between religion and science. Don't confuse penultimate curiosity with the ultimate kind. Travel in the slipstream, but don't let the wheels touch. Ever since the first appearance of Homo religiosus, human beings have been engaged in trying to make sense of the world as a whole and trying to integrate their lives with the whole depth of their experience. As a young man, Maxwell wrote uh, a, ref a reflection expressing the aspiration that his working life should, as far as possible, be integrated with his fundamental ethical and spiritual identity. Happy is the man who can recognize in the work of today a connected portion of the work of life. And an embodiment of the work of eternity. And that's an aspiration which is just as important for an artist. As it is for a scientist. Thank you.